Good afternoon, everyone. This is David Beach. I'm in the Bureau of Library Development. I'm a library program specialist, and I manage the LSTA grant process. And we're here for the 2020 LSTA grant application training webinar. And we're going to just go through each one of the pieces of the application itself. And anytime that you have any questions, just go ahead and uh, put your hand up so we can answer the questions as we go through. If you think of questions after the fact or at the very end, we'll certainly be glad to answer any of your questions at that time as well. Uh, the first thing I want to do is just start out in the regular DOS grants system application. That's what you see on the screen currently. And in order to apply for a grant, you, of course, have to register in the grant system. So on the live page, there's a place right at the top right hand corner where it says register as a new user. So if you're a first time user, you want to click on register as a new user. Fill in your name, first and last name, and your email address, and that'll get you registered. And then you can return back to the login page. And then before you sign in, you're going to have to create a password. So you can also go up on the same area there and click on Forgot Your Password. And it's going to allow you to put in your email. And then it's going to send you a link to that email address, and then you'll be able to create your password for signing on to the live grant system. Now, if you happen to be someone that's with an organization that has not been registered on the system before, that organization is going to have to be registered as well. And if you need to do that, one way you can check to see if you're uh, available. I'm going to go ahead and sign on here real quick. And I'll show you. Okay, you can check easily by going up to the top of the page once you've signed on. And if you click under organization and you look for search organizations and put in the name of your organization. I think if uh, I put in like Bureau of Library Development. and then do a search, no results. So what's it in there, Ms. Marion? Division, probably? Probably. Let's try that. Okay, and then you see Division of Information, Library and Information Services, and then you can select that particular organization and see if that's your organization. Now, if you run into any kind of issues whatsoever, if you find your organization, but some of the information is not correct, or you have a, an organization that you're affiliated with, let's just say you're a division of a county uh, government, and you're one of the branches of that county government through your library, you may be in here as an associated uh, branch, or you may not. And if you don't find your particular branch, then get a hold of myself or Marion, and we'll certainly make sure that we get the information put in there that, that's needed to set up the organization, because you will not be able to apply, even if you have your individual self-registered, you're not going to be able to open up an application for the organization without having the organization registered in the system. Okay, so now we're going to make an assumption that you're registered as an individual, your organization is registered, and I'm going to jump over to our test system, which is looks just exactly like the live system, but we use it for test uh, uh, environments so that we don't uh, make any uh, 
changes to the live system that we don't want to make and or make anything crash that would that would not be good so what we're doing here is we're going to go in and we're going to start an application so what you want to do is go to the top of the page click on grants and then click click on apply for grant And you're going to get this display page here that shows all the grant programs that are available through our division. And the library grants are further down on the page. So you scroll down the page. And you look for Division of Library and Information Services. Over here, you see that heading on the left hand side. You see the kinds of grants that are available. And here's Library Services and Technology. And you see that there's a cycle open January 2nd through February or March 16th. So you click on apply now. And I've already got myself associated with a library here. So I'm going to pick one of these two that I'm associated with here. Now, when yours comes up, it's probably just going to show the name of your library, unless you happen to have an affiliation with more than one, which some people may. But I'm choosing the one library. And then I'm going to put in, I believe it's 2020 test application. Is that what it was, Marion? I believe so. Should have wrote that down. Okay. And there and it found it. It it works pretty much like the search does on the organization. So I've got this application started. If you don't have an application started, you're going to click on the button up above where it's new application and it'll open up a new application. Question? Yes. Uh, Michelle says, must it be a branch or can it be a, the county? The organizations are set up. If you are a branch library of a countywide system, if you're in a branch, you must apply through the headquarters of the system, but the project can be to serve an individual library branch member, something like that. And the same thing if the library is the member of a, if the library is a county member of a public library cooperative or of a single county cooperative, you must apply through the headquarters of the library system. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so once again, I'll repeat, if at this point you were brand new, starting a brand new application, you would click on new application. If you've got an application going and you want to return to that application to, to continue working on it, then you would find that on the list and go ahead and click on the continue button. So in our example, we're going to go ahead with the continue button. And this takes us to the first section of the application, which is general application information. Now, earlier I was talking about where you created your file for your organization. That information that's in your organization is going to be populated in this first section here, A through J. And you can see the type of information that's going to be required if you're going to have to build your organization information, you're going to have to have your federal employment identification number, telephone number, address, if you got a website, your county and your DUNS number. Those are going to be pieces of information that are going to be required to build that file. Then you're going to go on down to the next two pieces, the director, the applicant directors, the person that's the director of the organization, that's submitting the application. So in this case, under this, we've already chosen a person that is listed as a director for this particular organization, along with a telephone number. Same way, the project manager, that person could be the same as the person that's the director, or it could be someone else that's going to have uh, control over that project, that individual control over the project. Once again, based on the information, now you can look here and you'll see there's drop down information in here. So depending on what's built in your organization file, 
that's who's going to show up on here. So if you happen to go in here and you want to put somebody in here that's not already in the file, you're going to have to go back and do some maintenance on your organization file to add the name of the person you want included if they're not already showing up on this drop down screen. Once again, also telephone number and email goes in there as well. Then the DUNS number, which is the same as up above, same, same information, just carried over on to number three. Then you indicate whether you've implemented an internet safety education program. Your answer to this question is going to have some bearing on when the grants are scored later for the competitive grants, you're allowed some extra points because you have an internet safety education program. And that's a, for public libraries only. I'm gonna add, excuse me, this is Marion. I'm gonna add an extra comment there. The internet safety education program, and this is spelled out in the grant guidelines for you to be eligible to get the additional points that David is referring to. There are some criteria that have to be met. You have to have uh, have a program in place as well as having uh, trained a percentage of persons, and that's all spelled out at a in the guidelines you, if you have questions on that. Okay, thank you, Marion. Uh, also, for number five, then, the Rural Economic Development Initiative, if you're a county that's eligible, and I believe there's some municipalities that are eligible for that as well, you want to mark that. Uh, yes, if you're not, then you mark it no. Once again, that's going to impact whether you're going to be required to have matching funds or not on the project. That's the impact of that answering yes to that question. It'll make a difference on the matching requirement. So that's it for the first page. If you look up above, up here on the left-hand side, you can see the, the different uh, sections. And you see an arrow on here, a check mark on here, that indicates the minimum requirements have been met for that particular page. So as you're working through your individual pages, you'll know the progress you're making on the project application itself. So that you, you know, if you've got a page and it doesn't have a check mark on it yet, you know that you've got some information that's still required that you haven't indicated on that page. And you can also go back at any time while you're working on the application and edit a section that already has a check mark in it that will not lock you out. You can go back and forth. It's just to make sure it just is an indicator to you to show that the minimum required data has been put into the system. Um, so just so you know what that is, you can go back and edit that as much as you want. Okay, so. We're saying we're finished with everything that's required for the time being on page one. We're going to hit. Now, I would suggest as you finish a page, you save it. And then you proceed to the next page. I'm waiting for the system to finish its save. And also, let me also say this. If you want to build your file for your application, you can go in and take these questions off the individual pages and you can copy and paste them over to an outside Word document. So if you don't want to spend your time in the system and, and then all the requirements of the system, you can build your file outside of the application itself. In fact, that's something we would recommend. It's much easier to do your edits in a Word document and then cut and paste the information into the system as opposed to trying to edit it in the system. But it's, it's your choice. But we would, from folks having done this before, we would recommend that you do it that way outside the system and then add it. Okay. And now we're going to go ahead and we're going to hit next. And that's going to take us to project information, page two. And if you happen to be filling out more than one application, you're gonna mark a number one, your priority ratings. If you've got three applications and you're working on the one that you consider the one most important, the one you'd like to see approved the most, whichever, you would mark it on here as number one of three applications. In the case at hand, we have one application and that's all this organization is, is putting in as one application. 
In number two, the targeted user groups. You're picking who you're targeting with your project, who is going to benefit from what the project's carrying out. And in it's of course you see in the instructions you got to pick at least one, but not more than three. So there's a list of all types of uh, target user groups there that you could select. And number three is pretty much self-explanatory: the project service area, municipality, county, or region. The project will serve. In this case, it's it's just an a county, an entire county. And then number four, which is a very important one, this information will carry over into your agreement, your uh, contract agreement that you sign for the project if your uh, funding is approved. And it's a concise standalone summary of your project. Kind of a, you know, a synopsis of what you're going to do with your project, what your project going to accomplish. And uh, points aren't given for lengthiness at this point, more for being to the point and saying exactly what you hope to accomplish with your project. It's a standalone abstract of the project. So we're going to go ahead and we've finished this section. We're going to save what we have in there. And then we're going to go to the next page. And it's just a good idea to get into that habit every time you go from page to page. Save next. Save next. Just carry that out throughout the entire application. The next section is uh, entitled Introduction. This is There's various questions here that you're answering in this section. The first one is, where are you located geographically? Just Give, you, give a good description of where your library service area is within the state of Florida. Number two, you're stating how many staff members you have. And you see this is, this is uh, stated in full-time equivalents. In other words, you got, in this example, there's 26 and a half full-time equivalents. So you got 26 people working full-time and a half a person or a person working part-time, part, obviously, not a half a person. Uh, then you name how many outlets you have in your library system. It may be one, it may be a hundred. It depends on how your system is organized. And then you list how many registered borrowers you have in your system. And number five, you state what type of governance your system has. It could be, you know, it could be under the the uh, county commissioners. It could be a library board. It could be a, a city council. It could be a cooperative board. So it just very dependent on what type of organization you have. And then number six, you can provide additional information about your project that might provide better context. Sometimes. It helps to add a little bit of information that might be unique to your particular library or your particular situation that's going to make a difference when it's being evaluated by the uh, State Library Council, something they may not know that may not be, you know, uh, general or uh, common knowledge, something that's important to the project itself. And I'd like to add something here to this additional information. If you are uh a library, if your project or your organization is for just a an individual outlet or area, this introduction information should provide information on your entire system or your entire cooperative. And then if you are focusing on a particular, for example, a member county of a cooperative, this is where you might provide any of that same information above for that participant, the county that you're going to be focusing on. Um, so just so Remember, the application is coming in from the larger organization, and then if you need to specify some smaller additional descriptive for a member or a subset, then that's where you would put that introductory information here for that. And I also want to mention the, the examples that we have in, in the narrative sections. These are basically samples that we've drawn from past applications, and we've 
made them so they're, you know, they don't refer to any particular area. We feel that these are good examples. They may not be the only way you can present this information in these narratives, but it gives you a, at least a good starting point and give you an idea of what the information would look like, if, you know, that pertains to these particular questions. Any more, any questions at this point? Okay, we're gonna save our page and move on to the next section. And while David is saving and moving to the next section, you can work on the application in any order. You do not have to go A, B, C, D, E. You can jump around in the application if you so uh, choose or if various people are working on different sections of the application. Yeah, that's especially important if you've got to wait for some information from somebody that, and once you, like when you get to your budget area, there may be some items that you don't have the information for that you have to wait, you know, until you get an answer from your finance person or whatever. So you can work on the sections you have the information for, and then when you have the remaining information, you finish out the, the balance, and then you can go ahead and submit your application. The next section is a very important section, and it's the needs section. And the first sentence here basically tells the entire story. And this is, I can't emphasize this one enough. This is very important. The needs section defines the problem to be solved by the project and who the targeted problem to be served is by the project. The need makes a case for funding the project. The library council will pay a lot of attention to this particular section. This is very important when it comes to decision making and how your project and uh, its viability will be judged. The needs should also come from the needs of your library users. It should not be the library needs this or the library needs that. It needs to be the end beneficiary's needs or what is lacking in from services being provided by the library to the end users. And when you're identifying the needs, you're identifying a target population, the people that you feel are going to benefit from carrying out the work being done in, in your proposed project. So you're gonna have a target amount of people and you're also going to have a narrative talking about that target population. That's what number two is. And then when you get into number three, you're going to be talking about why does the project need to be done? What is not happening now that you need to accomplish by carrying out your project? And then you'll go on to the next section. First, you're identifying what the unmet needs are, and then you're going to identify why those needs are not being met, what's happening today, whether it, you know, it may be uh, some, something in the financial, it may be geographic, it may be weather-related, population-related, it just depends. That's going to be unique to your particular area. In number five, you're going to tell us how your project relates to your long range plan and the mission of your organization. It just gives us a good idea of how you're going to carry out the project in relation to how you see what your mission and goal for your library is in general. And then once again, in number six, you're allowed to provide some additional information and uh, some additional factors that may make a difference as to why your particular project, you know, needs particular uh, attention. No questions? Okay. Um, also on this section, uh, as I said with the introduction, you want to, if you are in a part of a larger system or cooperative, the needs should be talked at, at the larger level, and then you can bring it into a specific needs in that particular county or branch or whatever it is. So you're kind of making that whole case for the project. Okay, now we're assuming we 
are going to move on. So we're going to save this section. And then we're going to hit next to move on to the next part. In this part, you get to identify who your partners are going to be. Who's going to help you carry out your project? Who's going to help you succeed? Who's going to carry the torch for you when nobody else will in some cases? So this is an important, it's, it, it's important in, in judging the likelihood of success in a project. The more partners that are involved, the more people that in the community that are behind the project, the more likely the project's going to be an overall success. Now, that's not to say that you may not have any partners. That is possible. But more than likely you will, and there's going to be other groups in your area that are going to help you complete this project. And, and just remember, vendors are typically not considered partners on the project. If you are paying somebody money to provide you a service, uh, to put in a new system of some kind, that's typically not a partner. It's typically a partners are, you're bringing something to the project and someone else is bringing something to the project that will help its success. And usually your partner is going to have some kind of vested interest in it, the same as you do. I'm going to, and you can see we have three partners identified in this section. If you have more partners, you can add a new record up here. I'll just show you. And it's show you put in the partner name and you add what the partners, what kind of role they're going to play. And then you save that particular partner's information. And that's pretty much it. That's it's pretty straightforward as far as filling out that partner information. So now that we've identified the partners, we're going to save that information. And we're going to move on to the next section. Now we have the activities section. Now the activities, I'm just going to read off of the activities heading up here. Add as many activities as needed to describe the project. Identify major activities to be undertaken by the grant project. For each activity, provide a name of the activity, a detailed narrative of the activity, what will be done, including a timeline, resources needed, and outputs that will be measured. I would caution you here, try to keep the number of activities at the very most under 10. We like to see most under six if possible. And you can combine, there's a lot of sub activities. Try to make this the major activities that's gonna they take to carry out the, the project. And once again, I'll show you an example here. When you add a new record, it's gonna ask you for the activity name. And you fill that information out, then you can put in a narrative about what the activities uh, you know, entails, and then you can save that information. And then down below that, you have a space where you add the outputs. And that, once again, it's going to number the outputs, and then you name what's going to be coming out of, as a result of those activities. And then you continue that. You can go back and forth between these. You can go back up here and add an output. You don't have to do this all in order. You always have an opportunity to add more information to these. Remember, the activities are the things you will be counting as part of the project, um, and you can have more than one output per activity. Yes. We just have shown ones here, but you can have multiple ones, multiple counts for a particular activity. And in addition to the activities, then you're going to be asked to list resources. And all, and all these steps, this, this may seem overly complex, but what we're really trying to get you to do as you fill out this application is get down to the root of what's going to allow your project to succeed and get you to think about all the facets of the project. 
So at this point, we're asking you what kind of resources are going to be needed to support the activities that you just named above. And then you'll list those resources, and then you're going to match them up with whatever activities above those resources appear in. And once again, I can show you when you add a new record, it's going to ask you for the name of the resource, and it's going to ask you the activity that it actually is associated with. Uh, it may be associated with all the activities. It may only be associated with one of the activities or two. If you have six activities, it may be all six. It just depends on what the resource is. If you have like a person that's a, a management person over the project and they're going to be involved in all the activities, more than likely the activity numbers are going to list every one of the activities because that person's touching every one of those activities. People have probably the most difficulty in on this particular section. But, uh, you know, it, it's don't make it any harder than it is. I, that's just what I'd say. Just just keep it simple. You do want to keep it simple, as David said, but you do want to be sure to provide enough information and detail so that when the council is reviewing the proposals, they know what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, in, in enough specifics to understand what you are uh, trying to do. That's often been some issues when the applications have been reviewed. It's just the activities were not enough detail was provided, so they really didn't know, did the applicant have a clue of what they were trying to do? I guess what I, I would say a good guideline would be that once you put this part together and you read through it does it make sense to you you know and then have somebody else look at it besides you and give you an objective opinion on it and say okay if you look through this would this make sense to you the way i've laid this out and if they say well, i'm a little confused that means that you might need a little bit more detail We're going to assume that we're done with this section for the time being, and we're going to save it. And then we're going to move on to the next section. Our next area is additional information. These are things that uh, you're going to tell us about how the project's going to be communicated and publicized to your community and what it's going to take to continue or sustain the project once the funding cycle is over. That's what the first two questions are. And those are pretty straightforward. And then if the project is creating digital images, which we've had quite a few projects in the past that have had digital image creating involved, you would mark that on here and whether you're gonna have uh, metadata records involved, and if not, why not? And that's pretty much it for that section. That's pretty straightforward. But one thing that's important you think about, not just from our point of view, but your point of view, okay, everything's good, things are rosy, you get the money for the project, you got money to make it last for a year. What happens in year two? Is it a project that would uh, easily be completed in a year and, and nothing to worry about in year two? Or is it going to be something that just gets a good start in year one and year two is up in the air? Those are questions you need to answer for yourself and for the continuation of the project as well. I think I've seen a question come up there, Melissa. There is. Can you please define metadata records? That's the uh, file that's created to track the digital image. Uh, wish I had a, a data person in here that could give you a better explanation. 
it's basically the cataloging information for digital images is my short explanation of it. We can get you a lot more information if you need it or want it. Digital images. You know, it, it's the, it basically is the documentation that goes with the digital image. Right. It, this this section is intended for those folks that are doing digitization projects. They are scanning uh, images, uh, images uh, such as uh, historical records, historical photos, uh, 3D images, whatever those types of things are that are being scanned and then being made available in a in a catalog. Uh, an example of that is here at the division is our Florida memory program where the historical images have been scanned. There is metadata image that has been added. Yeah. For every image, there's a file that basically describes that image is, is what it is. Mm -hmm. Good. It's um, data about data. So descriptive metadata is descriptive information about a resource. So if you right click mm -hmm. on something, you can usually get the metadata on whatever that document is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We obviously don't do a lot of digitization <laughs> ourselves. We know we have to have it, but there are many more experts than us here. <laughs> Any more questions? And there again, number three is only going to come up if your project involves creating digital images, and that is the core of the project. Okay, we're moving on here by saving that page. I'm sure you're getting tired of me saying that, but I can't emphasize the save and then the next you're going to move also on. Also a note as to what David is saying with save. If you are working in the section and you're not just copying and pasting, if you're thinking about it and writing and stuff, again, recommend saving intermittently because the system may not think you're there anymore. It may have gone away. You may not realize that and um, something may be lost. So just save early, save often, save often, save often. Okay, next section is evaluation. It's, this is a very important section and becoming more important because evaluation from the federal uh, grants point of view, they're requiring certain minimum uh, evaluations and each year I foresee in the future, they're going to ask for more. So the evaluation is how your project is going to be judged basically as it's implemented. And it's also going to provide a measurement to, to see how successful your project was. So you may have set some targets for yourself and then you're going to evaluate and see if you came close to meeting those targets. And we have some an explanation here that goes through the indicate, you know, what an outcome is, what an indicator is, what source is, and the method that you're going to use. In most of the cases, not every case, it's going to be some type of survey as the way we've been doing, you know, doing business recently. But that may not be the only way. You may do other things besides that. You could do face-to-face -face interviews other things besides just surveys. So at the first section in the narrative about evaluation, you're going to talk about who's going to be responsible for evaluating the project and when those evaluations are going to occur, and then describe the tools that are going to be used for making those evaluations. Now on the outcome section, there's, I believe, three, is that right, Marion? Three that are required to be included, and you indicate whether you're going to measure those or not. You can, right, you must use at least one of these outcomes. Um, you can use two or three, but to measure each outcome is going to require some work. So be judicious in the number of outcomes you are actually using to measure changes in the project or the success of your project. But these are the three that you know, that we have that are across the board for all the projects. You're gonna use one, two, or three of them. 
and um, you can use additional ones if you want. But again, as we said, like activities, we don't expect to see a whole lot of outcomes because it does take work to do them, to measure them. And you can see like number two, that one, this particular uh, entity decided that that was one they were going to use, the use of new information services. And they have put in, you know, what the indicator is going to be, the source of the information, and the method that they're going to use to measure it. If you were going to add another record, you can see you can add another record under that easily, naming the indicator, the source, and the method for gathering that information. If you're not going to use a, one of these outcomes, you just mark it as not applicable as number three is marked. And then once again, you see number four, this entity chose increase KSAs as knowledge, uh, skills, skills and abilities. abilities. So once again, depending on your particular situation, your particular project, which one of these you may choose, or if you have a different one that you're gonna measure, that's what number five is for that wouldn't include one of the three above. And this will be a, a subject area that will be discussed further when we get in, you know, if your project gets evaluated and approved for funding, we'll be talking more about evaluation because those evaluations may very well become part of your uh, deliverables. Okay, we're gonna save our section. We're gonna move on to the next section. Next section is one of my favorites and probably most people's least favorite because you're talking about money and you're talking about allocating it and how you're gonna take the money if you get approved and how you're gonna spend it and how you're gonna allocate it over the different budget categories. And these are prescribed categories for LSTA grants. Other types of grants may have different budget categories, but these are the ones that LSTA uses. And this particular example covers most of the categories and, and shows you numbers put in and in depending on and as you can see up above here in the explanation this screen allows you to show how many grant funds you're going to use cash matching coming from other sources and then what the total is going to be and then what the system does is it takes and i'm going to scroll down here just to show you as you're filling this out it adds up the total down here at the bottom of the page. This number here in number eight ends up being the request that you're making for the total amount of funds you're making to the panel, to the State Library Council. So when they look at this, they're gonna see, you know, ABC entity wants $18,799 for their project. They're putting $12,692 of their own funds or funds coming from another source, not federal funds to put towards the accomplishment of the project. So this is calculated as you go and as you save, this will add it up. So if you get down to the end and you see, well, no, I, I asked for 20,500 and you're not getting that number here, then you know you've got a number up here in one of your categories that's not correct. So it's a self-checking and it's gonna add as you go. Each time you save, it'll create a new total down at the bottom. But the first section that's included in this category is salaries and benefits. And you might remember a little bit earlier, we talked about this FTE, full-time employment, or full-time employment or equivalent. In this particular project, the manager is spending 13% of their time working on this, accomplishing this particular project. 
So that's where this value comes from. And then the, the grant funds, they're not using any grant funds for the manager's salary, but they're using it as match because obviously this person works for the entity and they get a paid a salary. So you can allocate match out of that salary that would be paid to that person anyways, that becomes part of your match. So when you're doing this, you also wanna go down below and once you fill out something in the detail section above, it's gonna require that you fill out something in the narrative. The program will ask you for a narrative to support what you put in the detail box above. So I can show you here real quickly. When they add a new record, you have in all this is salaries and benefits. So it's always going to be a position title. What type, what type of equivalency is the person spending their time on, whether it's grant funds, cash match, and then you just save it after you enter it. The narrative is basically it'll be a, a vacant box when you start and you'll be able to type in the narrative and then you save the narrative. A note on this section, when you're explaining the salary amounts, if you're using grant or matching funds, you want to be sure to show both the, don't just put a dollar total in there because if you have a, a salary amount plus benefits, it can really skew a number. So you wanna break it apart. This, this person's salary plus benefits at 29% or 40% or whatever they are. And that helps eliminate concerns or comments from the reviewer saying, halftime person being paid $50,000 or whatever the figure might be. It just helps eliminate those questions. The next section is contractual services. And as you can see, a common contractual uh, arrangement would be for to bring in a speaker or a consultant or something to that effect. And uh, in this particular example, they're paying for that person with with grant funds, no match for a total of the $2,500. And the adding the new record works the same way here. Just a description of the contractual service, the funds, either grant or match and then you save the entry once you have that information entered. And then once again, a good narrative. And so in other words, what I would suggest, if you have three different contractual arrangements, you can come down here to the narrative and number it one, two, three, and give a narrative for each particular one. So you know what's, what's what, and you know, you're itemizing it by the entries that you have for each agreement. Bottom line, you do not want the evaluators having to guess or interpret what you've written. They need to be able to clearly understand what you're asking for and how much it's going to cost. Okay. Library materials is the next section. It's, Question. yes. How do you calculate benefits? Please repeat. Benefits, you would need to check with your organization. The benefits are typically a percentage that is applied based upon the salary amount. Uh, for example, your salary is X, benefits by that by the county are typically charged at 26% or whatever that number is. And it varies from organization to organization, so I can't tell you what an absolute amount is. Uh, when you're trying to figure out the time on the project, you need to estimate what time, if it's your salary, you need to estimate how many hours or how much of your time will be spent on the project. Then you would take that times the, amount, the number of hours times your salary and add in the benefits to that to get your, um, to get your dollar amount. And the next section is library materials. And so we have a couple of typical examples here of materials, you know, that would be considered library materials, print materials and eBooks. And once again, how it's funded, the total and an explanation. And then under that section, it's gonna ask a couple more questions about 
if you're purchasing what live materials for the library and if yes are you creating bibliographic records for those materials and if not why not supplies very similar a lot of times under supplies you'll see like uh, if it's presentation material you'll see all the paper supplies and everything that go along with creating a presentation you'll see that typically in this area another quick question yes salary so i as the librarian i figure out the percentage of my time and calculate with my salary yes like we just explained you would figure out how much of your time is being to be spent on the project if you need to charge your salary as a match to the project you need to again check with your organization administration some do not want salaries used as match some do it really depends upon your organization but if you are going to use your salary as a match you need to determine well how many hours or how much of a percentage of your time you're going to be spending on that project and then you would get that salary amount based upon that if you're spending half 50 percent of your time on this project it would be 50 percent of your salary plus the benefits percentage to get the total amount. Then number five is travel. Travel is common for projects, depending on whether it's travel for people that are consulting or doing contractual arrangements or whether it's travel for the people carrying out the project. It could work either way and once again it's pretty self-explanatory it's a description of what the travel's doing how the funds are distributed and then an explanation of how the travel funding is being used please pay attention to your rates that you're using when you're estimating travel you must use must all capital letters must use the state of florida travel rates which are different from the federal rates for mileage as well as what your county or city may be using for mileage um, be sure to use the state rates and that's the same thing for mileage for meals for per diem that type of thing uh, it is state rates are different from most everybody else in the state of florida and the federal government rates they are less okay let me scroll back down here and as you see i just saved that statement must use state of florida travel rates i just typed it in that box and saved it and you can do the same thing as you go in and out of these pages. Equipment. Okay. Cost for equipment and furniture to be purchased and used by the project. This includes, and it shows you here, computers, desks, chairs, and a useful life. Anything that has a useful life of one year and a cost of $1,000 or more should be on this list. Now, if you have a composition of equipment that's under $1,000, you can list that under the other category. But we have to track the equipment we're required by the federal government. So that's why when it's over $1,000, we ask you to itemize it on this particular list in this detail page. The adding the information is just like the other pages. A description of the item how it's funded and actually on this section there's an item that should actually not be in this section item three the installation costs should actually be under either contracted or other because it's not a piece of equipment you're right we'll fix that there you go and this is how you would fix yours if you find something you put in and you want to take it out there you go just delete it it's that simple and once again, I, uh, I would encourage you to do a good job of describing in your narrative down here what you have in the detail up above, just to make it simpler for the, for the evaluators when they're looking at your project. And once again, down below, 
if it's miscellaneous equipment and the unit costs under a thousand, you can put that under other. And some areas, some uh, organizations have an overhead cost is the best way to describe indirect it. Cost. A what? Indirect cost. Indirect cost. They would go in this area as well. Then you have to check with your financial officer to find out if your organization is using indirect costs or whether they want them as a factor in the application. And there are certain limitations on that, and that is spelled out in the grant guidelines. Um, one other thing to note in your budget, where there is matching requirements, they do not have to be line item by line item matching, and they do not have to be category by category matching. We just check at the end of the day, does your matching meet at least one third of the amount of grant funds requested? So you could have equipment being purchased, but you're matching with staff time, something of that nature. It does not have to be staff time with grant money, staff matching time, or you know, it can just be in one or the other. Okay. We're going to assume for the time being that this applicant is done with the budget. I'm going to save the section, move on to the next. Next section is certifications and attachments. There are certain federal forms that are required when you apply for an LSTA grant. On this list of forms, number one and number two are required. Number three is required for public libraries. Number four is only required if you're engaged in that activity. And number four will be required probably the least amount of times, depending on whether you're uh, functioning as a nonprofit organization or something in, in that order. And then number six is for support materials. Anything that you would like to add to the application, one thing you see in this area added many times is a service area map, which the uh, review board, the, the State Library Council seems to like those because they like to have an idea where, where your service area is at in relation to the rest of the state. So that's an, an opportunity for you to add items that you think would help support your project and your need for grant funding. If you have any kind of issues in this area, as far as filling out the certifications and attachments, Marion and I are always available to answer detailed questions. And also we're gonna make a PDF available of a training session we did last year. And if some of you that are on here participated in that, you might recall that we went through the forms with the exception of number five last year in detail and we'll have a PDF available with the follow-up on this to this webinar so that if anybody has any questions on those forms, you'll get your answer there as well. And after that section, we have the last section of the application. If we get this to... Hello. Okay, review and submit. Here you're basic, basically authorizing your authority as a person doing the application and you have the authority to make the application and that you have not made any false statements and under penalty of law basically and then you type in your electronic signature. You'll notice at the bottom of the page it shows anything that's incomplete at this point. When you try to submit the application, it'll give you error messages. And you'll see that these are live links. When you click on that link, it'll take you back to where, and as I told you, number one and number two are required. And as you see, we haven't uploaded anything. So you're getting an error message in each one of those areas saying that document's gonna be required. Now I'm gonna go back to the review and submit one more time. And 
once again, you know, that's all that's there. Once you fill this out, if you don't have any errors showing up that need to be corrected, your application is going to be submitted. And that submit button will not become visible until you've corrected all the errors. Or if you are have a role that allows you to submit the application, there are different statuses in the system of grant editor as well as grant submitter. Um, and so if you're just an editor, you would not see that submit button. If for any reason you would happen to submit in error, you could contact Marion or myself and we can work with you on that as well. Get you back to and, and we could get you back into the application mode. Uh, but at any time, you know, any questions, feel free to contact us. So uh, we'll now the one thing that David hasn't mentioned that I, I do want to mention um is that we are available to review drafts or help you with drafts of your application. The draft does not have to be in the system. You can send us a Word document. You can send us a partially complete application. If you want to talk about ideas, what have you, we are available to help, as are the, our, the liaison consultants and the subject specialists here in the Bureau. Um, as we say, as I'd love to say, start early, start often, because we will review drafts and help you in the order that the information comes in. We help people up to the day of the deadline, um, and the deadline is through 11.59 p.m. on the day it's due. We're not going to be here that late, so start early, start often. And we do have a question. Um, could you please repeat what you said about asking permission regarding matching salary slash benefits? Asking permission of whom? Um, you would need to talk to your uh, administration uh, in terms of uh, what they, different counties and cities have different policies for matching funds on grants. Um, and so you would need to talk to your administration, whether that be a, and again, I'm not familiar with your situation, whether it would be your branch manager or, or administration of the system, your director. Um, uh, it depends upon your structure. You would need to uh, find that out locally. So they would be they would actually be providing funds. Again, the matching depends. But we do allow in kind funds, such as the county pays for someone's salary, and that salary that is being used for the person to work on the project. Those are allowable matching funds. Um, you cannot use as matching something that has previously been purchased and use the value of something to be used as matching for the grant. It could be purchased during that same time frame as the grant. For example, if you're purchasing materials during the year that that grant is implemented, they could perhaps be used as matching funds. Um, it really depends on your situation and what you're trying to do. Um, and wanting to do. The matching funds should relate to the project itself. So um, there's a lot of variables in there and we can have a more in-depth discussion with you if you need to on that matching part um, for that project. And remember, depending on the, the size of your request, if your request is under 10,000, then matching doesn't have to be an issue. You can still provide matching funds if your organization wishes to, but you don't have to. So that's one way to avoid the matching issue altogether is to ask you know, for a grant under 10,000. Your choice. So my salary, which they are already paying? Yes, that could conceivably be used as match. It again, depends on your organization. And I know that we're over time, but we're just answering questions now. So does anybody have any other questions? You can either raise your hand and we'll get you unmuted, or you can type into the chat panel. And while you guys are thinking about questions, um, stay tuned for um, a follow-up message that will be coming through your email in the next day or two with the, this recording, hopefully, and uh, a PDF of some slides from last year. Yes. Last year, the slides that we put together for the forms, with the exception of the number five form, which is a new form for this year. So 
that those slides should provide you additional details that you may have on questions on the uh, the forms that are part of the, the certification page. And once again, what Marion mentioned a while ago about uh, asking for help on the application and sending us samples, but please don't wait till like the day before. Give us a chance to give you the benefit of, of our being able to spend time on it and give you a good appraisal. And the only way to do that is to get it to us as soon as you can so that we have time to look it over. We're not going to be able to do it justice by trying to look at five of them in the last two hours of the last day, so. We'll try, but no guarantees. Yeah, and we will, we do, we'll give you every every bit we can, so. All right, Brad says, can one organization submit more than one grant proposal? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Easy answer. <laughs> and you, the only thing you have to do on that is you have to, if you remember at the top of that page, and I don't remember what is that on. It's at the beginning page, of the, you have to prioritize the You have to prioritize them. And how you prioritize it is up to you. There's no science to it. The, the council has chosen to fund something that was not the first priority. It has also chosen to fund just the first priority. So it, it's just it's another kind of piece of the puzzle. A snapshot into your thinking, basically. Yeah. And that's, on, uh, that's in section two at the top of the page, the setting of the priorities. Does anybody have any other questions? We're going to stay on for a couple more minutes to make sure we get any questions you guys think of answered. Um, but if you think of things later, you can always contact Marion and David and they can answer those questions. We'll for be you. glad to help you. Uh, our email contact information is in the grant guidelines. There is a link to a, uh, a uh, grants office email address that will get to us as well. So you do not need to send it in both places, but we will, we do see that we have various ways to get a hold of us. Um, Any other questions? We're glad to bounce ideas off of, you know, if, you have, if you're just thinking about a project and you, you're not even sure if it's something you want to do, we'll be glad to just uh, have a discussion with you on possible ideas. We, if we have something, we can send you uh, uh, samples of successful applications, but I would recommend you have an idea of what you're looking for so that we can match you with what you need as opposed to just a a uh, spray of information shall we say and Marion and I both are in and out of meetings quite often so don't get discouraged if you don't hear something back right away and if you've got an idea of what you want to do and you can put it into a short you know outline or whatever send us an email and give us something to chew on so that when we can you know get back to you, we will have an idea of what you're looking to to try to accomplish. I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, we'll give you guys another minute or so, and then we'll, um, you're welcome, Joyce. Um, we'll give you another minute or so, and then we'll log off. But I uh, thank you for everyone that was on today. If you don't have any questions, um, hopefully we'll see you online again soon. But if you do have a question, please, this is a great time to ask it.